Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I am your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, you are going to hear me speaking at, a, at an event, at a mastermind group that I spoke at about a month ago. Uh, this group is uh, gathered by Ellis Hammonds, and it's a great group of guys and gals who are uh, are driven, they are focused, they're ready to hustle. Uh, many are already hustling and making things happen, and uh, just a great group. Uh, I hope that you enjoy um, this. Uh, I, I love sharing my story with groups like this, and uh, I think today you're going to hear probably parts of that story that you've never heard before, even over uh, or after uh, over a thousand episodes. I think there's probably parts of this that you, you've never heard before. Uh, and so I hope you enjoy the show. Hope you are motivated, encouraged, uh, and I'd love to hear from you as well. Uh, feel free to reach out to me personally or uh, get in the group, the Facebook group, either one. But I hope you have a blessed day. I'll start with a little bit, little story. And uh, many years back that uh, I, we were, um, I usually, so I came on, I was on a large stage about two weeks ago in front of a large group uh, talking about real estate. And, and I immediately get on the stage and I say, boom, I, I just threw a hammer through the drywall that I just hung up. I was so angry. I was so mad. Chelsea was, uh, we, we were newly married. We'd only been married probably a year and a half at that time. And she was so mad at me as well. I had spent her money. I had spent her money, but it was a great deal. It was a great deal. Who said that? <laughs> Who said that? It was a great deal. I couldn't understand it. Like, why couldn't she understand that it, this was a great, this is a great deal. It just made so much sense, right? So during this time, you'll hear more about this story or, or what was happening. But my wife and I, we'd been married, like I said, about a year, year and a half at this time. We were remodeling a house while living in it. And uh, she had had to wash the dishes in the tub for a lot longer than I would like to admit. And it was quite stressful. I was a police officer then as well, working the worst schedule, working every night, weekend, and holiday, um, working all the overtime I possibly could, just I mean, making practically nothing. Uh, it felt like anyway, right? Um, and so that pushed us in many ways, uh, but also we, we had a desire for her to be at home. We had children. And so I, you know, I knew making, what, 25 grand a year, uh, maybe 30 if I worked a bunch of overtime, maybe 35 if I just really cranked out all the overtime I could, you know, it was going to be very difficult, right? So, so I'm going to come back to that story uh, later or as I talk, uh, because it's so much of that is applicable to exactly what we've been talking about today when we're talking about husband and wives and, and different things. It's so important that you're both on the same mission. And at that time, Chelsea and I were not. We had not talked about all these things. I mean, we were just newly wed. We did not receive great counsel, uh, you know, really growing up. Uh, you know, we weren't really believers at that time. We thought we knew the Lord, but there was no relationship uh, really with, with Christ. So we know that now. Uh, but we, you know, we would have said, oh, yeah, you know, we go to church every Sunday. Uh, but we did not have a relationship with the Lord, really. It was not a big part of our marriage, and, and it was uh, it's, it's obviously different from now. But, uh, but I want, just want you to think about that scenario. We were not on the same mission. You know, we were not going the same direction with our, with our business, for sure, right? I'm going I'm to share a secret with you right off the bat. I want you to pay attention. So everybody wants to know how we went from raising $250,000. So on my first project, I raised $250,000. It took me weeks to do it and tons of work. Man. You know, but I was thankful. I was so thankful. No friends and family invested. You know, nobody in our family is or, or wealthy. It didn't come from money of any kind whatsoever. I had the best job probably anyone in my family had had ever had, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But then, you know, being able to consistently raise tens of millions, you know, in a few hours now. I think Andy was talking earlier about, you know, want to be able to do it quicker or faster, right? Uh, and there's some, there's some ways to do that. It takes time. It does not happen overnight. I want to tell you some critical things about my mission, my mindset, our why, uh, you know, and my how, you know, how we got to where we're at. And, and I want, this is probably one of the most important things, too, uh, is, is teach you how to not be transaction focused, but loyalty focused. Very important if you want to raise a lot of money. So the secret to scaling fast 
You have to show up to give. Seems simple, right? Seems simple, but it's something I have to work on constantly. It's something I have to work on in every conversation. I have to show up to give. I have to think about, you know, when I'm interacting with someone for the first time, I want to be there to serve them. I want to be there to serve them. And that is going to change the way you do business. It's going to change the way you think about other people. Um, and we'll talk about that some more as well. But it is, it's another mindset shift. It's not always win-win. Forget about win-win, like just show up to give. Over the past couple of years, 150 million in assets. Uh, Ellis uh, talked about some of this. We do have a, approximately 85 million on contract. We have three development projects as well going on that's not in that. And, um, interviewed over a thousand people, you know, many, quite a few in this room as well. And my network ha have, has exploded and, uh, you know, I've been able to talk in front of many, many stages now, many, many people, hundreds and, and even thousands at times, you know, people I never imagined being able to speak in front of as many people as I have. A few years ago, uh, you know, actually probably four years ago, if you'd asked me, uh, uh, even probably what a podcast was, I would have, may not have been able to tell you what a podcast was. So it's interesting to see how things happen. And I remember probably two years before that, I was, we, my, or Chelsea and I were at a couples retreat and I went forward to, and I was praying with my pastor and I can't even remember where this came from, but he, he was praying and he prayed that the Lord would use me to speak. And, and he compared me to like to Moses, uh, not, not wanting to speak, you know? <laughs> and and, and I, I thought, where did that come from, you know? Uh, and it's, it's so interesting how the Lord does those things, you know, and I get to look back and, and just praise the Lord. I try to figure out what I was gonna do as a career. Policing seemed like an easy transition. I love the uniform, love the service and the discipline. So out of 1,200 applicants, there were five positions with Kentucky State Police. I was blessed to have one of those. Loved working the road. I, uh, I mean, I would, I would work for, I would have worked for free the first two years. I loved it. And, and so, you know, I'd work every Friday and Saturday night because that's when I could get into the most stuff, you know. And, <laughs> I, I mean, really, that was before I was married as well, uh, you know. And, and then finally, finally we get married and, and she knew if I came home, you know, if I didn't get home till like six or eight in the morning, then she knew something happened, you know. She'd be like, what happened, you know. But anyway, we'll get into a little more of that. But being a police officer was great. But again, making 25, 30 grand a year, there was just no room for advancement. There was nowhere to go. Also, guys retiring, making 40 grand a year, you know, with 30 years of service on, finally, uh, the writing was on the wall. You know, like, okay, you know, where am I gonna go here? What is this gonna do for our family? I had no college. I almost felt a little helpless at this time, okay? This was the same time that we had moved as a couple and we, we had moved and to get closer to family. We were part of a church where we met another couple the Lord just used to, to save us, speak through. Uh, and it's amazing tes their testimony and then how, they used, how He used them to speak to us as well. But during that time, it was obvious. We just passed each other in the hallway the first whole year of marriage. You know, I just said, you know what? As much as I enjoy this, it's just not what's best. It's just not what is best for our family. So I had to make a change. And so we did. We made a big change. I, uh, during this time too, and you'll see a little more about it in a minute, is when I actually got into real estate. Being a, uh, in, in law enforcement, that's what pushed me to supplement our income, right? I was looking, looking, trying to figure out what, are we, what can we do to supplement our income? I learned that, you know, not only had one or two people built wealth in real estate, but like hundreds of thousands of people have built wealth in real estate. And so I thought, okay, if, if that many people can do it, then, then I can probably do it too. Something, right? I may not be Donald Trump, but, but I, you know, I can probably do something to supplement our income. We wanted my wife to be able to stay at home when we had children. It was going to be very difficult on 30 grand a year, right? So, so we pushed, we've, we, we bought two triplexes and man, we learned a lot the hard way. <laughs> made a ton of mistakes, but we got started. I, at the same time, I became a federal agent. Uh, again, very difficult process, uh, getting hired as a federal agent, and, and, uh, but it was a big step up for me, right? I, you know, I, I doubled my income immediately, a better benefits, better everything. I mean, working the normal schedule now, I can actually sleep uh, you know, in the same bed as my wife at, at the same time, you know, and, and all those perks, right? Uh, and, and we'll talk about that a little more in a minute, but just remember that was, that was probably the, one of the best J-O-Bs, you know, anybody in my family had had. 
Uh, and so you can imagine when I start to talk about real estate and doing something completely different, you know, that's kind of a, a shocker, right? This is probably more of a shock to some of you. <laughs> Who is that? Yeah, that's me. That is me. That's me. <laughs> The 17 year old looked more yeah. like. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, since I was a little boy, I wanted to train horses, loved riding horses. I was, it was just a passion of mine since I was, I was very young. So, we moved to Virginia, and believe it or not, we, we bought a farm, and I, I was training again, and, and we still had some rentals. I had, up to, I had a 15 unit building at this time that I'd partnered with, a, with another guy on. I started training horses and I was, I mean, I loved it. I was doing clinics all over the country. I was doing lots of lessons. I was selling horses for more money than I ever imagined. I mean, I never dreamed. I'd be, I mean, so every horse I sold, I stood in the saddle and popped uh, stock whips in both hands. Um, and so other, you'll see another one in a minute, but uh, that, I mean, just lots of tricks, lots of things. I never imagined being able to do those things, but this took an extreme amount of time extreme amount of time to get to this level um, and, and to be able to do these things. Um, so this horse right here, his name's Shamrock. He's pretty special. He's probably my best ever. But uh, so I, I did lots of tricks with him at Liberty, meaning nothing on him. I can ask him. Um, so many horses I'd teach to lay down. I'd stand on them while they're laying down and pop whips and throw tarps over them, all kinds of stuff. So just to give you an idea, it took lots of time, right? Lots of time. So I was also working full time. I was training at night till midnight most nights. Uh, you know, just sacrifice the family time to make all that happen. Um, and, and, I, and I bring this up because you may also have a passion that's somewhat holding you back. You know, it's like, could I have made a lot of money training horses? Yes, I was making better money than I thought I probably could have, you know, even while I was only doing it, you know, after hours, after my federal agent position. However, it was never going to be passive. It was never going to build wealth. And I mean, everybody wanted me to train their horse, wanted me to give them lessons, right? And so, so one, um, yeah, I'm gonna, I'll go ahead. Uh, one fall, Chelsea and I were walking on the beach. We were just praying and we were just really reflecting, right? On where we're at, where are we going? Do we see ourselves like doing what we're doing now, three years from now? And it was just obvious then. I mean, I, we just, we almost can't explain it how we both just had peace about this. Um, Cause I'd obviously invested a ton of time in, into this, okay? And, and it was becoming pretty well known at that. And so as this was like beginning of September, and by the end of September, we had listed our farm for sale. We decided, you know what? If we're gonna be committed to commercial real estate, we're gonna be all in. So we sold our farm. Between Christmas and New Year's, we were moving out of our farm. I mean, like the house we'd always dreamed of, the farm. And that was very difficult. You think, you know, and that's why I say to this passion, it may not be horse training for you, but you know, this thing that I just, I wanted to do since I was very young and I was, I was like doing it, you know, I was finally like achieving that, but I could see that, you know what, this is, this is really going to hold us back, our family. If we, you know, I'm not going to be able to pursue real estate, you know, by in doing this at the same time. So we sold the farm and we sold everything to related to the horse training business. Um, so here's those two triplexes. I'll get into a little more of that story. But here's those two triplexes. Uh, yeah, you know, again, tired of chasing tenants and toilets. And, and uh, it wasn't a scalable business model. You know, it just wasn't very scalable. Uh, and I say, I say there's, I still have so much brain damage from these two buildings. <laughs> I mean, it, I, I say th those words, the apartments, and Chelsea still cringes, you know, like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know, that was such a difficult time. Because I was self-managing, did not have a clue what I was doing. Uh, did, just did very poor due diligence, a number of things. Um, but, you know, the biggest thing was the time I missed mentally with my new bride. You know, we'd been married less than two years. And, man, my mind was just always thinking about the tenant that was fixing to move out. You know, or trying to get that, that, that unit turned over or the AC unit that was failing. And, you know, I should have known about that before we bought them. And, you know, all those things, right? But, um, but... During that time, when we sold the farm, we also, as also when I went to my first real estate conference, okay, a large conference. And again, I started meeting guys and gals who were buying 100 unit complexes and they'd only been in the business a year or two. And I thought, wait a minute. You know, I, I mean, I, I really thought that, you know, to be able to buy a 100 unit building that you had, you had to have been doing this 30 years or more, right? I mean, who, who does that, right? I don't, I don't know who those guys are. Maybe one day I could do that, but I never expected it. 
So, but I went to I went to this this conference and my eyes were opened again to all these people that were doing it. And again, I thought, okay, hey, if they can do this, I can probably do something bigger than what I'm doing now, right? So we did. My eyes were opened. We sold the farm. And an uh, important part here is I hired a mentor. Hired a mentor. I knew that I wanted somebody that had been there and done that. I did a big process on finding what I felt like was the right mentor. A few key things. I wanted somebody that was in the business now. I wanted somebody that I could speak to personally, not a team of coaches under them. And somebody I just felt like that genuinely cared about my success. You know, did a lot of due diligence on bigger pockets and different places. Ask questions. People will share with you their experience, you know. Um, and so I just encourage you. I have many mentors now. That was really a, a mindset shift. Uh, you know, to, when I hired that mentor, it was twelve and a half thousand dollars. And we were fixing to start another adoption process. We knew that was fixing to cost us another probably 50 grand. And that was a lot of money to us. And we, you know, and Chelsea and I both were like, should we really do this? Should we hire a mentor? You know, so glad I did, right? I mean, it's just a no brainer now, but at the time that was a massive amount of money to us. Obviously we started a podcast. Um, You know, many of you or a few of you in here have been interviewed over a thousand days straight now. And I encourage you, if you want to hear more about the story, like with Chelsea and I, show 1000, 1001, and then it was a Saturday, Sunday, the next Saturday, Sunday, uh, it was just a series of us just talking about that whole process and in much more detail and really her, her talking more. Uh, so, oh yeah, building teams, hiring people, scaling. We're going to talk about this again in a minute, uh, but doing a daily podcast pushed me to do things that I would have never done before, Okay. I've, I've personally never edited the first piece of audio, the first piece of video. I've never made a piece of artwork. I've never posted a show on our website, on the internet, anywhere, okay? Because I knew doing a daily show, there's no way that I could keep up. It was not possible. If I'd done a weekly show, just the way that I would have thought, I would have said, you know what, I'm gonna save some money. I'll, I'll do this myself. I'll learn how to edit some audio video. I'll do it, I'll be able to do it. I would have gotten frustrated and most likely quit, honestly. Uh, And and it wouldn't have even seemed as bad either. because You know, there's a lot of people that start weekly shows and quit. Right? That happens often. But not too many people start daily shows and quit. Well, they might. I don't know too many people that even try it. And I wouldn't even recommend it to most. (laughs) So, um, but what's behind that growth is our why, our mission. Ellis mentioned David Platt. When Chelsea and I moved to Roanoke for that federal agent position, we we were listening. we, We had just... We were really new believers at that time. And we were just growing in our walk, growing in our faith. And, and we were exposed to David Platt and a thing he does called Secret Church. If you, if you don't know about it, I encourage you to look it up. But uh, we had just moved there the next weekend with Secret Church. And we went, he was talking about caring for orphans and widows. And I mean, we grew up in a one stoplight town. I mean, I didn't know anybody that was ever adopted. I didn't, I mean, I was never exposed to that really. Uh, that I can remember, Chelsea or I. But David was talking about how they had adopted, how there were over 150 million orphans in the world, how it can cost 40 to 60 grand to bring a child home through adoption. And I mean, I mean, we didn't have a clue about any of that stuff. But on our way home, all we could ask ourselves were, why would we not adopt? Why would we not adopt? It just seemed like the right thing to do. I mean, it seemed that simple to us. And I'm so thankful now that we're really ignorant to the process. <laughs> I mean, really. I mean, it, we've done it four, four times now with one failed placement. But, but anyway, it, it's, uh, it is quite the roller coaster, but worth every, every second. So we didn't know. I mean, I had no idea. But we thought, why would we not adopt? So within a week, we turned in our application to adopt from Ethiopia. Two years later, our first son, Samuel, comes home from Ethiopia. A year later, Elijah comes home through adoption. He was born in the States. And our, our daughter, Eden Joy, now uh, also came to our family through adoption. She's two now. So this mission has, has changed everything about us. Or, you know, this, this, uh, this thing the Lord did in, in Chelsea and I at this time, we had no idea what it would be now. Uh, and, you know, and even through our foundation and whatnot now. But, but it changed everything about our business. Okay, and it's changed everything about, uh, I mean, even the growth of our business. I didn't see that coming. The Lord had a different plan. The Lord had a very different plan in how He was going to use all this. But the importance of your why, uh, I mean, it, it is everything for us now. And, it, and, it, and it's becoming everything for many other people now as well. Thank you for listening to The Real Estate Syndication Show, brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, 
while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.